Praise God. That's one of my favorite songs. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We're getting ready to partake of the Lord's communion. If you need a communion element, please raise your hand and one, one will be handed to you. It's almost surreal being here in this place. There are many of you here I can see that help work on this and it's just really exciting to be here. And it's a one year anniversary, I believe. Tomorrow will be one year. And you see how God is just accelerating things in this ministry and it's all to the glory of God. You know, it's all to the glory of God. You know, I was thinking about what Ramsey shared earlier about being freed from depression and many other things. And, and that's what we're about ready to partake of what made that happen, what set us free. Those of you watching online, if you want to partake with us, you just need to receive Jesus as your Savior. He's already forgiven you of your sins. Please go ahead and get something that would represent wine and bread, a cracker. We're going to partake of what the Lord did for us. It's so amazing, so awesome. You know, the children of Israel, they had been in captivity and slavery for over 430 years. And when it's time for them to leave the night before, they took communion. And how many of you know, if you've been doing hard labor, you probably have some injuries. There were some elderly people, there were children, they were women, they were probably pregnant. But when they took communion, they left the next day. The Bible says, we're going to go to Psalms 105, verse 37. It says, and he led the, the Israelites out, and they carried silver and gold, and all of them were healthy and strong. If that can happen before the cross, how much more can we have it now? Amen. They were looking ahead to what was going to happen, to what we're going to partake of today. If you're bound by anything, any sickness, any disease, any strongholds in your life, any addictions, put your faith in this and you could be set free right here and right now. Amen. It's already been paid for by His stripes. We already are healed. Amen. We can get a report from the doctor, but you know what? Where are you going to put your faith in? You get a scripture from the word and you stand on that and you hold on to it until you see it happen in your life. I'm a witness. I've had many miracles happen in my life from physical healings to emotional healings to being set free instantly from depression. So I could so relate when Ramsey says that. It's real, and it can happen for you today. Amen. We're going to believe together. So let's go ahead and get the bread or the cracker or the wafer, <laughs> whatever you have. We never want to leave out our online people. It doesn't matter what date it is when you're watching this. You put your faith in what we're going to do, and you're going to be set free. And please let us know. Check with us online. Share with us your miracle. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for giving your son, for sacrificing him. What it must have done to you to see him go through what he went through for us. And Jesus, we thank you that what you did was more than enough to set us free and to bring us back into right relationship with the Father. Because that's what you came for, to restore us back to the Father, a loving Father, a kind, tender Father. Let's go ahead and break the bread and partake. Father, we just thank you for healing bodies right now, for healing emotions, for setting people free from addictions, Father. We just thank you. We call it done. And the blood that was shed to cleanse our conscience from sin. I got two of my sisters here today. I'm so glad that they're here. But it was probably about a year ago, I was talking with my sister Linda, and she said, we forgot what we were talking about, but she said, that's sin consciousness. And it's always resonated with me. And I thought, boy, how many times have I had sin consciousness not really recognizing that this cleanses me from the consciousness of sin because he died and he paid for all my sins, past, present, and future. And I could be conscious of my right standing with God and that he has paid for all my sins and he's paid for all of yours. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let's go ahead and partake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can I get a praise from somebody this morning? Thank you, Lord. God is good. Well, welcome to Deep Rooted Church. Is anyone happy to be in the new house of the Lord this morning? For those of you who have uh, joined us for the very first time, you have no idea what we're even talking about. The past year, we've been in a building right in the middle of a massage parlor and some other company. We had no clue what they were doing. And that was on 2027 West Ashland Avenue. Fun fact, if you want to drive by there today, you'll still see our stickers on the doors. But we were meeting there all year long for 2021. And actually, May 23rd, tomorrow, a year ago is when we moved in and had our very first church service ever. The year went on. The Lord showed us incredible things. Last year, or entering this year, we, we as a church wrote a vision list. And we had everyone who wanted to participate write a vision list with us, writing down all the things you're believing God for in this year and the years to come. And one of those things on our vision list was either expansion of the current property we had or a bigger and a better property. And by the glory of God, by the grace of God, we are sitting in a new, bigger building than we had previously. Give it up for the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you are worthy. You are so good to us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for everything you've done this year. And we're expecting greater things to come in the years to come. If you believe it this morning, why don't you shout amen. Amen, 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 amen. It's a lot more spacious in here, ain't it? Feels good. You have some elbow room. Got some comfy church chairs. You know... The Lord did something really incredible with all of this. These chairs were gifted to us by the previous church that was here. And if those of you who don't know why that's a big deal, for the chairs, we were, we were looking to buy these chairs for our other property just so that we could have comfy chairs. But the caveat was these chairs were bigger than the current chairs we had. So we'd be losing seat space, but we'd be adding comfort. And so we looked into buying around 40. You know how much it would have cost us just to buy 40 church chairs? Over $2,500. We have, not in this room, but in the church property, over 115 church chairs given to us for free. Isn't the Lord good? The Lord is so good to us. And you know, all the glory goes to God, but it takes cooperation. It takes participation on your part, on our part, to receive those blessings from the Lord. The Bible says, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom. Who wants that kind of overflow in your life? But Jesus set, set the requirement, give, and then it will be given. There's a lot of people waiting on blessing, a lot of people expecting to receive something from the Lord, yet they haven't taken the appropriate actions to receive from the Lord. Now don't get me wrong, we're not paying God, we're not buying Him off, we're not bribing Him to get us, give us a blessing. We are simply activating our receiver. When we give, we open our heart to receive more. When we sow into somebody's life, we are appropriating a principle called seed time and harvest. You plant the seed, you wait some time, and the harvest will spring forth. It's a principle of God's kingdom. And in fact, it is the way the kingdom of God works. It's not a way, it's not a common way, it's not a preferred way, it's the only way God's kingdom works. You plant a seed into the ground and it will spring up a harvest. It is the only way. 
And by the grace of God, we are standing here in this building today. Not because we paid somebody off, not because we bought someone something nice, not because we did anything else but activated our receiver. We blessed people, we trusted the Lord, we planted seed into the ground, and now the harvest is springing forth. And let me tell you, this isn't the hundredfold harvest yet. This is just the 30. The 30's here, the 60's coming, and the hundred's on the way, amen? amen? Glory to God. Give God praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, for those of you who don't know, we've been in a partner project. We started this last month in May. Wait, what are we in right now? April. We started it in April. And we've been believing God, releasing faith for $25,000 to get this place ready. And like I said, we'd be doing it in steps and stages. But for the most part, we have like almost every stage done except for little tiny parts. God's been so good. But we've released faith for $25,000 to raise, to move into this place, get the paint on the walls, get the equipment ready to go. And we're not there yet. Just because we're in here doesn't mean it's completed. But we still have a little bit to go. Last week, if you can put that up there, last week we were at 31.34% complete. So if you make the math in your head, 25,000, 31, 31%, you'll get the picture. This week, just under a percent came in and we are at 31.93% complete. Glory to God. Hey, every bit counts. Every bit counts. If it's 1%, if it's 10%, if it's 0.1%, it go, all the glory still goes to God. Amen? So we only have 68.07% remaining. We're almost at the halfway mark. Look, friends, we're already in the building and we're not even halfway. What more can happen once we get to halfway and when we complete it? Amen? But just so you know where you're investing into, you're investing into the ministry's operations. So the partner project that we're doing right now to raise $25,000 was to get this place ready. That's done, almost. And to invest into more equipment, better equipment for our sound. Look, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people on this stage right now. Guess how many more we can fit right now? Zero. We're maxed out. So in order to get more people on stage, more musicians, more worship leaders, we need a better soundboard. And so we're believing God for a soundboard in the next couple of weeks, and that's what that $25,000 partner project fund will go to. So we're believing God for a new soundboard to upgrade the sound equipment, more lights to upgrade the lighting, and more cameras to upgrade our online presence as well. You know, we're already in 29 other countries around the world, thanks to our broadcast and our podcast. So we're gonna upgrade those things in the, in the times to come to reach more people, to spread the gospel all around the world as far as we can get it. Amen, can you believe it with us, with me with us with that? Can I speak some English this morning? God's been so good. If you wanna give, there should be uh, offering envelopes in the seats in front of you. If you don't have one for some reason, raise your hand, I don't know. Is that the right protocol? I'm not sure, I'm just the pastor here. I don't know anything else. If you want to give online this morning, you can give at deeprootedmi.net slash give. Uh, don't get too familiar with that website because it's changing to deeprooted.church pretty soon. But if you want to give, you can give on our website. If you have our church app, you can give on there as well. You can also text to give to 833-750-1750 and all proceeds will go to the correct spot. Or you can mail in your cash or check note. Don't send it to that address. Send it to 1001 West Noble Avenue. Not 101, 1001 West Noble Avenue. And it'll come to this place, we'll receive it, and uh, it'll go wherever it needs to go. If you wanna designate it to the partner project, there should be a space on your offering envelope to designate to partner projects or general operations. Please designate it so we know where it's gonna go. But if you have your offering ready, go ahead and stand as we pray for it. If you're still writing, and that's all right. Who's believing God for a big thing in their life? Amen? It should be all of us. We moved in already, but we're still believing God for more. More what? I don't know. Something. Right? We should never be at a place where we're not expecting more. Where we're not expecting more blessing. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. 
But the Bible says that he gives more grace to the humble. He gives more grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but if you found out that there is more of something good, wouldn't you want more of it? Yes? Three of you. And I don't know if this is proper theology or whatever, but I am greedy for more of grace. I am greedy for the grace of God. And I want the grace of God to fall over all over this place. And man, it has been happening ever since we decided to come into this building. Grace has been overflowing and we want that grace to fall on your lives as well. Amen? So let's bless the offering. Father God, we just thank you for every gift. We thank you for every giver. We just know that these seeds that they're planting this morning are going to be blessed in Jesus' name. They will prosper a hundredfold in this life, Father, that we can be a bigger blessing to more people. God, we thank you for everyone here. We thank you for what you've done and what you're going to, what you're going to do in the future. We call you faithful to finish the work you have started here in the ministry and in the lives of everyone giving this morning. We love you. And everybody said... Amen, amen, amen. Well, let's say this all together on the screens. Something good will happen today because He is good and His mercy endures forever. I will have abundance, all sufficiency, and more than enough because He is good and His mercy endures forever. He is my shepherd, I shall not want because He is good and His mercy endures forever goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Ushers, you can wait on the people. Good morning, good morning. Well, here we go. The first message being preached in our new building. You know, I keep calling it our new building, but it's an old, old building. And let me tell you, it is an old building. In fact, we have two members at our church right now who used to attend this church when they were little, little children. Bob, why don't you stand up or let's acknowledge Bob. Bob is one of the the members that used to come to this church long ago. Nineteen fifty-nine. Wow. Wow. Yep. Yeah, the, so the sanctuary was flipped around. This was the entrance. The entrance was over here, and the, sanctuary, or the worship stage was over there. And they've remodeled this many years ago. But it is so awesome seeing this come full circle. If you don't know, Bob is one of my family members. And it's, it's as if he... This whole entire ministry and this calling of, 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 it's just come full circle. That's all I can explain. It, it, it came full circle. And now we're here. Now we're in this church and, and we're preaching and we're doing church together. And I am excited on what the Lord has done, what the Lord is doing right now, and what he's going to do in the future. Now I want to tell you, this isn't it. We're not stopping here. Who knows where we'll be in a couple years from now, but I believe the Lord will call us to build our own property, build our own building, buy our own land, and do something great wherever he calls us to do it. So this is just another stepping stone to the future that he has in store for us. You believe that with me this morning? Good. Good. You guys ready for the word? Turn to John chapter 11. Verse 39, John chapter 11, verse 39. If you're not familiar with this passage of scripture, this is a story about Lazarus. And Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha. The Bible says that Jesus loved Mary and Martha. And he loved Lazarus. He had this special love for for this family. And there's many times where Mary and Martha are in the picture and, and Jesus is talking to them and, and you see kind of the characters of Mary and Martha, how their temperaments were. And I think Martha was a little bit more like me. And uh, we had this a lot in common of wanting to do a lot of work to get a lot of stuff done and not knowing when to stop. 
And that's what Martha did. One time she invited Jesus into her home, and it says that her and Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. But Martha, she was distracted by many things, and she disrupted the whole service by making a ruckus and asking Jesus to tell her sister to help her serve the people. And she was so busy. I don't know why I'm talking about Martha right now. I'm not going into this story at all today. But that's who Martha is. And Mary, Jesus described her as the one who did the good thing. And that good thing will not be taken away from her. And that was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, not worrying about what you need to do, all the the tasks that are not checked off your list, not worrying about those things, but just listening at the feet of Jesus. And so we get to this story where their, their brother had died. And in fact, while he was dying, they sent word to Jesus saying, my brother Lazarus, he is dying. Come see him. And the Bible actually says that Jesus, after he heard the news, he stood in the same place he was for many days. And by the time he got to, to Lazarus, it had been four days since he first heard he was dead. And a lot of people ask, well, why did Jesus wait? Why did God wait to go see Lazarus? And the Lord told me, that's not the question. That, that, that isn't the question at hand. The question is, what did Jesus do when natural circumstances were yelling at him? Did he rush? Did he sprint? Did he worry? Nope. He stood right where he was at. And he wasn't worried. He wasn't stressed. You know what someone would have normally done? If you got a call right now saying someone's on their deathbed, many of us would leave this service right now and go see them. Why? Oh my gosh, I have to go see them. I have to go over here. We have to go over. Let's go. We got to go pray. And there's a panic, right? Not with Jesus. He stays in the same place. And he tells his disciples, the disciples even ask, shouldn't we go visit him? And he says, nope, our friend Lazarus is just sleeping. And they said, well, why would we go visit him and and disturb him if he's just sleeping? And so Jesus had to tell his disciples, okay, he's not sleeping, he's dead. So we have to go over there. And so they finally make their way to the tomb. And the scripture says that, that Martha, she ran to Jesus and she said, if you were only here sooner, my brother would have lived. And Mary came to the same thing. If you were just here sooner, my brother would have lived. And so we pick it up right here where Jesus is at the front of the tomb of Lazarus. And he says this. He says, take away the stone." And then Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Oh, Jesus, it's it's stinky in there. Don't don't roll the tomb away. It's going to smell She was more worried about the smell than what Jesus was about to do. Mm. Some people are more worried about what's going to change, what people are going to think about you, instead of what God can do through you in certain circumstances. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'll look funny. That'll be weird. I can't do that. That's not normal. I'm not comfortable with that. We're too comfortable with our flesh, friends. We're too comfortable with how we feel. And Jesus, take a look at what he said again. Verse 40, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see? If you would believe, you would see. We live in a world that tells us seeing 
is believing. Right? Wherever we go, seeing is believing. You have to see it first before you believe it. Or I won't believe it until I see it. Right? And at some point in our life, we, we age from children who believe in this fantasy man in a red suit, flying around the world, dropping off presents in one day, let alone one night. And they believe this, and they have such an easy time believing, right? And as they get older, what happens? People start telling them what to believe. People start saying, that's not real. People start saying, that's not realistic. Think realistically. You ask a child what they want to be when they grow up, and they say, I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. I want to go and do this and that. And they have all these crazy dreams, right? But as they grow up, you ask them again, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I don't really know. I don't have my degree, so probably whatever I can find. And they're thinking realistically, right? Some of you right now are in a circumstance. Your life right now has been throwing realistically at your face, realism at your face, your whole life. You cannot see what you want to be. You only see what you are right now. You only see what you are limited to right now. There are some of you who have been sick, who have been afflicted, who have an ailment, And you've had this ailment for so long, you can no longer see yourself healed. You can no longer see what you used to be like. Amen? Amen. We are so stuck in what we can physically see that it hinders our future. We've been in in a series called Transition. And last week we talked about not looking back. God's called you to do something. Go. Don't look back. And today, I want to talk to you guys about another part of transition, specifically for this church and for your life, preparing for power. Preparing for power. Jesus told Martha that believing comes first. If you want to see in your life, I'm not talking about with your physical eyes, but if you want to see in your life, believing comes first. Amen? Amen. You know, someone might ask the question, why did Jesus not only take so long to get there, but why did he even go in the first place? We've read this story of, of Jesus healing a centurion's daughter. And he just said, just speak the word only and she'll be healed. You don't have to come into my house. Just speak the word and she'll be healed. Hmm. How come Jesus had to go to, the, to, tomb, to the Lazarus's tomb? He could have just said, Lazarus, get up. And he would have gotten up. I believe the reason why is because Jesus was going to see Lazarus and to see the people. He was looking for faith. He was looking for faith. Jesus could have spoken the word and Lazarus would have gotten up. But that would have gone against everything he came to preach. That would have gone against everything God has set into motion. You see, a lot of us have an understanding, a misunderstanding, that God can do whatever, whenever, and however he wants to. Right? A lot of people have the understanding that God can just do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to. If he doesn't want to heal that person, Well, that's his will. If he does, that's his will. Who knows? It's God's will. It's a mysterious will. There's a misunderstanding. But what I want to tell you guys today, in order for you to prepare for the power of God in your life, you have to know what's your part and what's God's part. 
Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus looking for faith. Like I said, he could have done it where he was at. He could have spoken the word and he would have risen. Do you agree with that, with me with this morning? But he didn't. So that tells me there's something more to the story. He went to the tomb looking for faith. How do I know that? Well, that's exactly what he said. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory? In other words, he's saying, how come you don't believe? Why don't you believe? Why are you so stuck up in the stench of the tomb than believing what I can do? He's looking for faith. He's looking for faith. Faith, it is the connector to the power. You want to see the power of God working in your life? You need a connector. You know, there's telephone poles right outside of this building. But without a connection to them, without a direct line to those telephone poles and wires and those transformers, we'd have no power, none, because there's nothing connecting us to the source, right? Faith is your connector. And when you have faith over a thing, power is connected. When you have faith for something in your life, power connects. Without no faith, without faith, one, it's impossible to please God, but without faith, there's nothing appropriating the power of God. It's a big word, ain't it? Appropriating. I never heard that word until I started reading the Bible. And it's not even in the Bible. <laughs> That's a church word that I, I, I've never heard appropriating until I heard about these truths. How to appropriate the power of God in your life. How to make the power of God work in your life. It takes faith. There was a person that was physically blind. And I know we've, we've shared this story before, but there was a woman who was, who was physically blind. And she went to go get prayer to, to see and to be healed. And the minister kept telling them, he said, do you want to see? And they said, yes, I do. And they'd pray over them, and they'd, they'd pray over their eyes, and, and they'd say, what do you see? And the person would open their eyes and say, I don't see anything. And he would tell them, shut your eyes. I didn't tell you to open those eyes. And so she closed them again, and, and he started praying again, and he said, what do you see? And she opens her eyes again, and she goes, still nothing. He says, shut your eyes. I did not tell you to open them. And she goes, well, how am I supposed to know what I'm seeing if I can't open my eyes? And he said, you have to see in your heart, you physically seeing before you can actually see. And so she closed her eyes again, and he prayed, and he said, what do you see? And moments went on, and she st st stood there for a while, just closing her eyes, and she said, I can see. Before her eyes were even open, she started seeing things, and she opened her eyes, and her vision was restored. You have to see in your heart before you can see in the natural. This place didn't happen without us seeing it in our heart. This ministry cannot happen without us first envisioning it in our heart. Let's go in a negative direction. You cannot cheat on your spouse without first thinking about it in your heart. It's quiet in here. You cannot do something without first seeing it in your heart. It's impossible. Nothing just happens in your life by accident. Nothing just appears. Whatever your life is doing, however your life is going, the scripture says, is because of your heart. Because of your heart. The Bible says that out of the, the heart flow the issues of life. Whatever your life is looking like right now, it birthed, it, it started in the heart. It started in that, that visioner, that, that, that thing inside of you that can see something that's not there. That's where it all begins. And you can use it in a negative way or you can use it in a positive way. 
but there's a lot of people using it negatively. So can I encourage you this morning to start using it for the glory of God? Amen. Start seeing to believe. I'm sorry. What did I say? <laughs> start seeing in your heart before you see it out there. If you're not seeing something you're praying for in the natural, say you're praying for healing, say you're praying for restoration, say you're praying for something, provision, whatever it is, but it's not there, it's not there, you know what the, the best thing to do is? Start seeing it in your heart. If it's not physically there yet, you can keep seeing it in your heart. But a lot of the times, we just keep looking on the natural, right? It's not here yet. I guess I'm not praying enough. It's not here yet. I guess God doesn't want it in my life. It's not here yet. I guess I don't have favor. No, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Start seeing it in your heart before you see it in the natural. Amen? Amen. Let's continue. Come on, guys. I don't have all day. <laughs> Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. The faith chapter. This is the, the hall of faith, the hall of fame for faith. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 1, the King James Version says, Now faith is, someone say, now faith is. Now faith is. Doesn't say faith tomorrow. Doesn't say faith is the next day. Doesn't say faith was yesterday. It says faith is now. Now faith is. It's talking about right now, today is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My Bible I have written down here, I circled substance, and I wrote on top of it, the foundation of expectation. Faith is the foundation of expectation. The foundation. You know, we, there's a lot of use for the word hope. A lot of people have used the word hope. A lot of the world uses the word hope. And political campaigns have been made just by the word hope. Hope for the future. Hope for this. Hope for that. Let's hope and hope and hope, hope, hope. Right? It's a lot of, a lot of hope in the world. But faith and hope are connected to one thing. And that one thing is a foundation of expecting from God. You see, the world can hope all they want. People in the world can say they hope and, and, and talk about hope and say we have hope for this, but you know what they're really saying? Yeah, yeah I, I hope that happens, but it's probably not going to. Yeah, th that would be nice, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Oh, yeah, I, I really, really, really want that to happen. Yeah, that's good. That's what they're saying. There's nothing else to it. But our hope, Bible hope, it has to come with expectation. Expectation. There are some of you who came to church this morning I said, man, I hope I get a word from the Lord. Really? What does that mean to you? Did that mean, oh, I really hope I can hear something from the Lord today, but if not, no worries, I, I never do anyways. Is that hope? No. I really, really want to hear something for me today. But if not, it's okay. Is that hope? No. A biblical hope is, has a foundation of expectation, expecting something, coming into church this morning and expecting to hear the Lord. Today we're preparing for the power. We're preparing our church and your life to start receiving the power, but before you even can receive it, you have to start expecting it, right? I was watching this re remodel yesterday on, on YouTube, those of you who Want to know how I spend my spare time? And uh, they, I was watching a remodel, and they were doing a kitchen. And they are putting in new cabinets and, and a new range and, and a new fridge and, and all this, this good stuff. 
And one of the things that they did while they were building the whole place was measure, right? You measure to install things and to build stuff and, and whatever. But they were measuring all the, all the spaces and how big these cabinets were going to go. But then after they put all the cabinets in, I noticed there were two giant holes in the middle of both cabinets. I said, what, what in the world is that? And I know what that was. I'm not that dumb. But they are slots to put the range and to put the refrigerator. Now tell me, do you think they're expecting to put a refrigerator in that hole? Yes. Now how dumb would it be if you, were, if you went to Lowe's or you went to this cabinetry place and you bought the, these beautiful cabinets, oh, they're the best wood, best material, and you hired someone and they put them in and they're all level, they're straight, they're aligned, they're perfect, but you forgot the spot for the range? You weren't expecting it. You forgot about it, actually. Expectation requires you to do something. It requires you to prepare for something. Amen? There's a beautiful story here in our church of this couple who they were believing the Lord for a baby. And they heard me say, you want a baby? You start getting that nursery ready. You want a baby? You start making room for that baby. And they are pregnant today. And they are, they're expecting a child. There are some of you who are believing God for a car, for new transportation. Anybody? Anyone want a new car in here? Wow, you guys are cheapos, man. I thought we were in a blessed church, not in a poverty church. Let me see. Who wants a car? You get a car and you get a car. If you're expecting the Lord for a car, let me go ask you this. What does your garage look like? Is it cluttered? Is there a lot of stuff in there? Is there not enough room for another car? (laughs) But that expectation, it will require something from you. Preparation. And all this, this preparation, it, it, it ties back to what Jesus says. And seeing in the natural isn't how we believe. It's first seeing in our heart, believing in our heart, then seeing it come to pass. If you believed it in your heart, you would start preparing. If you believe that you're going to receive something in the future, you would start preparing yourself right now. There are some things that God will not do and cannot do because you're not ready. Get ready. I preached a message on that a while ago. Get ready. And if I have to tell you to get ready, it's because you aren't ready. And if you're not ready, don't expect it. That's the grace of God over your life. If God has not blessed you with something you're believing for, and you haven't done anything to prepare for it, that's called grace. Because you're not ready. You're not ready. God will not hand you something that he knows you're not ready for because it's going to ultimately end up in your downfall. Now, there's some things that that I want in my life and in our life, but we need to do something more financially better to prepare for something. There's some of you like that in that same situation. You want a new house? You want new this? You want whatever? How does does your life look like right now? Are you frugal with your money? Are you spending it everywhere? Are you saving it? What are you doing to prepare for the blessing God has in store? Can I get back to my notes? (laughs) Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Look at the new international version of Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. The confidence in what we hope for. Again, this is not the type of hope that the world has that just says, ah, that would be really nice to have that. But 
it doesn't look realistic. That's not that type of hope. It's a hope that's founded on expectation. Having confidence, knowing that what you want in the future, it's not in the natural, it's in the unseen. It first has to be seen in the unseen before you can see it in the scene. And it applies to so many, so many things in this life. In healing, in provision, in, in, in your job, in your family, whatever it is you're believing God for, it requires you to expect it, to hope for it, to hope. Thank you, Lord. Did anybody come this morning with an expectation to receive something from the Lord? You got to start doing that every week. Every time you come to church, expect something. Expect something great. You might not be falling on the floor and rolling all over the place. That might not be what you're receiving. But you might receive a word. One word in a five-hour message. (laughs) Or... It could be a friendly greeting. Someone said hi to you. They made your day. You received from the Lord. If that's all you get, so be it. You at least received. But be expecting to receive something. You know, the man who was laying at the gate in the, in the book of Acts, the scripture says as Peter and John passed by him, he was expecting to receive something. And this man was begging for change all of his life, could never walk, ever. And he's sitting at the front, at these gates every single morning, and he has this cup or this hat, whatever, and he's begging people, spare change, spare change, spare change. And it says he was expecting to receive something. Put a blank there. Expecting to receive coins. Expecting to receive an insult. Expecting to receive someone being nice to him. Expecting to receive something. And what did he end up walking away with? Did you hear that? What did he end up walking away with? Healing. He was at least expecting something. And if I'm being honest, that type of faith is better than what most of the church has and operates in today. He at least received something. There are churches all over the world that are dead, spiritually dead. In fact, if you called 911 to come pick up a dead body, the ambulance wouldn't know which one to pick up because the whole church is dead. (laughs) Glory to God. But can I tell you who the only person ever, the only person who has the right to expect something good is? Do you know? The only person who has a right to expect something good is the person who puts his faith in God. That's it. If you don't have faith in God, what you're hoping for is worthless. What you're believing for in your life is worthless. If you don't have faith in God, God, the creator of the universe, the one who provides for all, the scripture says that by his, by his, by his prosperity, he gives to us. Not by this world's economic status, but by his kingdom status. And let me tell you, his kingdom's never running out. It's not short on cash. It's not going through a gas shortage. It's not going through bread shortage. It's not going through baby formula shortage. His, his kingdom is abundant in all things that we could ever ask, receive, expect, imagine. He has more for us than we ever have thought. Amen? It's not based on this ec- economy. His provision is based on his riches in his glory. Amen? Not in this place, not in this world's world's economy status. But people who do not have faith in Jesus, all that hope will be is just a desire for something. A desire. And that's it. Oh yeah, I really want that. Nothing else though. 
You see how shallow that is? There's people all over the world who desire things, and that's all they do. They never receive it. Why? Because their hope is not on Jesus. Their faith is not founded on his word. Thank you, Lord. And the whole reason I say this is because this foundation, this foundation on faith, on God's word, is what supplies this entire world. Everything that we see and have today came originally from God's creation. These chairs, guess where they came from? The ground. These speakers, they came from the ground. This building came from the ground. Every material that is on this planet came from dirt. Can you understand that? It came from the ground, God's creation. And it is him who supplies everything for our life. And if we're not having our faith founded on him, if we don't have our hope founded on his, on his confidence, on him, we can't receive all that he has for us. Going a little further in Hebrews, verse 7, take a look at this one. It says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Mm. Noah, you remember Noah? Noah's ark built an ark in the middle of a flood before the flood started saved his own family, and started the entire population of the earth from just his family. Wow. Being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Take a look at what it says in in the Amplified Version. It says, prompted by faith... Noah, being forewarned by God concerning events of which as yet there was no visible sign, took heed and diligently and reverently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his own family. There was no visible sign. If you are genuinely expecting something from the Lord, you will prepare. If you are truly expecting to receive from God, you will prepare. If you're not preparing, you're showing me and everybody else and our Lord, you don't want it. You ain't ready. You know, what if, you know, you know in these movies where these actors get really in shape, for like a fight movie or an action movie. They get really in shape, right? Well, they take months and months and months and months of training and exercising to get their body into the physical shape it needs to be for that movie. In other words, they prepared. What would happen if an actor got cast for a role and a year down the line, when they should have been ready, showed up and said, all right, when's the training beginning? On shooting day. I can guarantee you they'd be fired. They'd be fired. And they'd probably get billed for the time wasted. You've got to prepare before you step up to the show. You've got to prepare before you step up to the plate. What happens in baseball? If you have no practice whatsoever and you step up to the plate and you're about to swing at the ball, nothing. No practice. This year, I had the pleasure and and the privilege of uh, coaching my nephew's soccer team. And it was really funny because we we went to our first meeting a a while ago and and got all the information we needed from the organizer and, and what we should do, what we can't do. We got our roster, our team name, and all that stuff. Then we find out 
that the first game nobody practices for. You just show up and see what happens. Can I tell you, it was an organized mess. It was crazy. Kids were falling asleep and rolling on the floor and walking around. They had no idea whose goal was whose, who, what ball was what. There was no preparation. So after that first game, we had soccer practice with them. And me and my dad, we, we both coached it. And we taught them the basics of soccer and, and just how to trap a ball, how to pass it, how to run after the ball, and all the, the basic fundamentals. But at the very end of the season, which ended yesterday, they had an understanding of how to play soccer. They might not have played the best. They might not have been the best team. In fact, we're probably the last place team. But they still understood soccer. And we scored two goals. Our first game, we conceded like 10 goals. But without preparation, without preparing for something to come, you're going to fail. You will fall flat on your face. I feel like I preached a message on preparing not that long ago. But the Lord just told me to do it again. But if you're really believing something from the Lord, you have to be in preparation. Yeah, I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for this in my life. Okay, that's a good word. What are you doing? How are you preparing? If you're not preparing... You can say that till you're blue in the face. It ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen, Captain. Can I ask you this, though? What would have happened if Noah would have waited until he saw rain? God tells Noah to build an ark where there was no rain. And in fact, I believe this was the first rain ever. The very first rain. And God tells Noah, build an ark. There's rain coming. I'm going to flood the earth. Good word, Lord. Good word. Oh, I believe that one. I'm going to tell my wife. I'm going to tell my kids. I'm going to tell my neighbors. I'll tell you what. The very first drop of rain, I'll get started on that ark. Sound familiar? Any of your lives? Oh, that, that's a good word, Lord. I, be, I believe that's for me. I believe you've called me to do that. I believe that, Lord. Let me just do this first. I'll do it when I see this happen. A lot of the times we put on this crutch and we use the excuse of Gideon. Oh, I'll throw out the fleece, fleece and I'll, I'll see it. if the fleece is wet in the morning, then I'll go do it. But if the fleece isn't, is dry and the whole ground is wet, then I'll do it. I'll know it's from the Lord. If a cat walks by this way and a bird flies over my head that way and a dog barks and a cat says hello, then I'll do what the Lord tells me to do. <laughs> Whatever happened to just trusting God, just trusting what he said, when he tells you to do something, just do it. I think, I think the Christian culture should have taken and copyrighted just do it. <laughs> go, go with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter Nine. I love this story. This story happens right after Jesus is on top of a mountain and he is glowing. He is transfiguring into the image of God and, and there's Elijah that shows up with him on the mountain and Moses that shows up on the mountain. It's an incredible sight. I've seen it in my head. Trust me. And there's a beautiful thing that takes place <clears throat> But while they were up there, there was something going on down the mountain with his disciples. And this person, they came to him, the disciples, and asked his disciples if they could cast out the spirit that was tormenting his son. And the disciples tried, and it got worse, and it got worse, and, this, and it, it didn't work. And so when Jesus finally comes down, they asked him, hey, Jesus, can you cast out this demon? Because we asked your disciples, 
and they couldn't. They couldn't do it, which is really interesting because just chapters before this, Jesus gave them authority to cast out every spirit and to heal people and to preach the gospel. They had the authority, and they were doing these things. They were casting out demons. They were healing people. They were doing all that Jesus called them to do. But then this comes up, and they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So they asked Jesus, and this is what Jesus says. In verse 19, he answered and said to them, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. In a sense, you can kind of feel the frustration. O faithless generation, bring him to me. There's times in my life, probably not in a godly way like Jesus did, I said, stop doing it, just let me do it. Because I can do it. You're having trouble doing it, let me just do it. Isn't that frustrating sometimes? Watching someone do something that you're the expert on? I'm no expert. I'm an expert at failure. How about that one? But Jesus says, the first thing that he addresses the people with, oh, faithless generation. How come your disciples couldn't cast them out, Jesus? Faithless generation. Have you ever had the hard trouble telling somebody who came to you saying, I've been praying for this, I've been believing for that, and it's not happening? And you say, because you have no faith. You have no faith. Sorry. The reason why this isn't happening in your life because there's no faith. That's what Jesus is saying. Faithless generation. How long am I going to suffer you? Bring him to me. Let me do it, he says. But then it says what happened with the child. And and Jesus, he actually asks the father. He says in verse 21, how long has this been happening to him? Here's Jesus in the middle of this chaos. This person is demon-possessed, convulsing and doing all these things. And he goes, how long has this been happening? He's our example. The same Jesus that didn't rush to the tomb of Lazarus is the same Jesus here with this boy, asking the father, tell me, how long has this been happening? I believe that one of the reasons why Jesus asked this question is, number one, to showcase He's calm. He's not panicked. But number two, this father, depending on how long he's had this son in this state, has had to deal with this natural unbelief of he's never going to get better. Look how long it's been since he's been like this. And so Jesus is asking, how long has it been? And I said earlier, there are things that you need to see in your heart before you can see in your physical life. There's a healing that needs to take place in your heart before it can happen in your life because if you don't believe it in your heart, it cannot happen. It cannot be done. His father said from childhood and, he, uh, and often he's thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, Have compassion on us and help us. And here's what Jesus says. If you can, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Jesus tells the man, essentially, hey, bro, it's not about what I can do. It's about what you can believe. I can do this, no no issue. But you got to believe me for it. You've got to believe I can do this. You see the cooperation it takes? Preparing for the power of God in your life, it requires you to believe. It requires you to only believe. And Jesus, he tells Jairus in another story, he says, only believe. That's it. Only believe. Did you know It is possible to believe and doubt at the same time. 
Let me show you. Verse 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. This father, he showcased honesty. He was honest with the Lord. He said, Jesus, I I believe you can do it, but help me in the area that I'm doubting. Help me where I'm not believing. That's honesty. And I, in fact, Jesus presumably can, can work with that more than he can work with, oh, no, I got all the faith in the world, but really you're doubting. Oh, no, 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 I believe, I believe, I, I believe it. I don't doubt. I'm not a doubter. You're the doubter. You see, being in denial isn't faith in a way. If you're denying all of the reality, you're just in denial. But if you're denying that reality is what dictates your life and God's will is what dictates your life, then that's faith. But if you're just denying things, oh, no, my arm isn't broken as it's broken, you're just in denial and no one can help you. That's like going to the doctor for a specific reason and then the doctor asking what's wrong. You say, oh, nothing. How is he going to help? How can he help you if you are not willing to confess? And the same thing is true with the Lord. If we try to brave face it and fake it till you make it, you'll die. If you try to fake faith, there's a fake faith out there that a lot of people are using. It'll get you nowhere and nowhere quickly. You've got to be honest with the Lord. Lord, I I believe, but help where I am unbelieving Help where there is doubt in my life. Help me in this area that I I, I don't know how to do this. Help me. God can work with that. God can help that. But it takes honesty like this man. And and if you go on reading, the scripture says that immediately he cast out that demon. And that boy was healed. And if we jump down to verse 28. In verse 28, the scripture says this. He When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out, uh, Jesus? Why why couldn't we cast out this demon? You just gave us authority. How come we couldn't do this? And you know what Jesus says? In Mark's recording of this, he said, this kind cannot come out. This kind can come out by nothing but Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. In Matthew chapter 17, this is the same exact story. This is Matthew's account. And this is right after the disciples asked, why could we not cast it out? Jesus says, because of your unbelief. I want to set the record straight right here. And as all of you as our witness, because of your unbelief, would you agree with me that this unbelief is the topic of this next part? Why couldn't we do this, Jesus? Because of your unbelief. And whatever he says following is in reference to that, right? So he says, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind, this kind of what, church? What? Unbelief. This kind of unbelief cannot come out but by prayer and fasting. Do you want to know why I know this is true? Because I don't know if my Bible's incorrect it has mistakes or something but nowhere in my bible does it say jesus went to fast and pray he came back and rebuked the demon did he or did he not do that he didn't he didn't leave for five minutes and fast he didn't go pray for an hour and come back no he was there why he was prepared he was prepared and friends there's a lot of you 
who will not, will not see what God wants to do in your life because you're not prepared. Do you know why fasting is so important? Why fasting is such an important thing to do in your life? It tells your flesh to shut up. It tells this natural, dying, decaying body of yours to be quiet. And a lot of the times, we need to, we need to do that. We need to tell our body to shut up. Our body tells us when to eat, when to sleep, when we're tired, when we're angry, when we're happy. Our body controls us no matter what. There's some of you who might not go to church on a Sunday because you're tired. Because my body felt tired, I had to sleep in today. There's some of you who want to leave church early because I got things to do. I'm hungry by 12 o'clock, so I got to go early. No, you shut your stomach up. There is, I believe, Smith Wigglesworth, great preacher back in the day. Smith Wigglesworth Whenever he would fast and his stomach would get hungry, he would look at it and go, be quiet, beast of you, and you'd eat when I tell you to eat. (laughs) He would tell him, tell his stomach, be quiet. But see, a lot of us are controlled by the flesh in a lot of areas. And this is specifically concerning to healing. People don't receive healing Because they've never, ever, 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 ever told their body what to do, when to do it. Ooh. Never. When was the last time you told your body, stop stop having a headache, body? When was the last time you told your body, you'll eat when when I tell you to eat, body? When was the last time you told yourself, I'll go to bed when I want to go to bed, the Lord's speaking? When? Not often. And we wonder why, why isn't this sickness going? Why isn't this pain gone? Why isn't my, my finances in order? Because you've never told anything to do anything, ever. And so Jesus says this kind of unbelief can only, can only, someone say only, only. and only come out by prayer and fasting. Preparation. You don't fast before, right before a circumstance happens in your life. You ought to be fasting before it, being ready before it, preparing ahead of time. Or else when it comes, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it listen to you. But it is possible to believe and doubt at the exact same time. And the only way you can get that doubt out, the only way you can get that unbelief out is by learning how to still your body, learning how to make yourself, your spirit in control of your flesh, not your flesh in control of your spirit. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, and if I can have the guitar playing behind me. Isaiah chapter 58. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm believing the Lord that this building is is a new, it's it's a launching pad into all that God has in store for this ministry. And not just this ministry alone, but for the people involved in the ministry. And I'm believing the Lord for this place to become a beacon of hope, a place for restoration, a place of healing, a place of deliverance, that loved ones will come back to the Lord, that people will be saved here at this place. We'll have people from the streets coming all over the place, from all of Visalia, Tulare, Fresno, Hanford, Porterville, everywhere, coming into these doors, forcing me to add another service. But we have to prepare for it. We have to prepare for it. We can't expect 
the Lord to do a great thing if we're not preparing ahead of time. In Isaiah 58, verse 3, The backstory to all of this is these people wanted the blessings of God. They wanted the favor of the Lord. They wanted the good stuff, the good benefits, but they weren't willing to do the work to receive them. And so they get to this point and they, and they cry out to God and they say this, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? You see, fasting has nothing to do with God looking at you. Fasting has nothing to do with God hearing your prayer more. It has everything to do with you hearing God more. You get that, church? A lot of the church has gotten this wrong, believing that if I fasted, if I did this and I did that, then God would hear my prayer, then God would answer me. If I fast for this many days, if we fast for the nation, oh God, the nation is going to be better. No. Fasting does nothing but help you hear the Lord better. That's it. If we were in service right now and I was preaching you a message and on the screen, This screen you had Fox News. This screen you had CNN. That back screen we had whatever baseball game is on today. If we had all these things yelling at you and through the speakers was my voice preaching a message, but also all the audio from all the TV, how hard would it be to hear my words and to keep them in your heart? Pretty difficult. If we had all these screens going off and Fox News and, and, and NBC and, or a comedy in the back or whatever or, or something on your phone is just scrolling like some of you are doing right now. How hard would it be to hear? There's too many distractions. But then what happens when you lower everything else but my voice? You can hear And when you fast, you're lowering the voice of your flesh. You're saying, flesh, shut up. You don't own me, flesh. You do what I tell you to do, flesh. And that way, whenever something comes up, say a sickness hits your body, or an ailment hits your arm, your your shoulder tweaks out, your back goes out of whack, and you have a circumstance, you can tell your body with confidence to act up in a right way, to straighten up in Jesus' name. Why? Because you successfully did the fast. Why do we fast? We fast so that we can depend on the power of the Lord to strengthen strengthen us while we deny the physical substance that strengthens us. When you're hungry, and you're working, and you're busy, and you're doing stuff, and you're, you're hungry, you can get tired, you can get cranky, you can get angry, you can get moody, right? You lose motivation. But if you're able to fast successfully and rely on the power of God, the strength of God to get you through that day, to get you through that time period, you fasted. You told your body what to do. You controlled your flesh. So when the next thing comes, it's going to be easier to control that too. And when the next thing comes, easier to control that as well. Right? And notice Jesus in the Gospels. Do you remember when he would say, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, right? Then he'd say, when you give, don't let your, your left hand know what your right hand's doing, right? But then he said, when you fast not if when when you fast don't do it like the Pharisees who have a sad countenance on their face oh I'm hungry there was a man that I knew and he 
showed up to work one time, and he was just, something was wrong with him. You can just tell. I asked, what, what's wrong? I'm hungry. I have, I've been fasting all morning. I'm hungry. And I almost slapped him. Said, Eat. You're better off eating. You ain't doing anybody no good. When you fast and you expect God to praise you, God to give you glory, for God to hear you more, you'd be better off just eating. You'd be better off eating. And that's what they said. They said, we fasted and you have not seen. Why have we afflicted ourselves and you don't take notice? And then he says, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all of your laborers. Verse 4, he says, indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do to this day to make your voice heard on high. We do not fast for our glory. Look at how long I've been fasting. That's not why we do it. We don't fast to get God to move. We don't fast so that God can hear us. We do all these things so that we can be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and less sensitive to our flesh. That's the only reason. It's as simple as that. Jump down to verse 6 with me. It says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? So this is the Lord speaking. Essentially, he is saying, this is why we fast. So is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Glory to God. That's what the anointing of God is. It's the yoke-destroying, burden-lifting power of God. Thank you, Lord. He says, is this not the fast that I intended for you? To loose those burdens, to, to loose those bound, bonds of wickedness, to undo burdens, to let the oppressed go free. If you're fasting and you're not getting those results, you're doing it wrong. It lifts the burden, not adds a burden. It releases the yoke of bondage, not puts one on you. It's supposed to set you free, freed from your flesh and listening to the Holy Spirit. Jump down to verse 9. I'm sorry. In verse 8, he says this. Nope, go back to verse 7. It says, Is it not to share bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? It's saying when you're fasting, you're supposed to be doing this to benefit others. If you're withholding from food, give that food to someone else. It doesn't benefit you anything. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do, but what he can do. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about others. And then he says in verse 8, Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That's the result of a fast. Thank you, Lord. In verse 9, jumping down, he says, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. That's another fast. You take away the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. We were talk- we've been talking about transitioning and last week we were dealing with the Israelites 
and the week before and how they were transitioning from Egypt to their promised land. Do you know what the one thing that kept them out from their promised land was? Complaining. Complaining. And I told you, we're preparing this place for the power of God and the presence of of His glory to be a light that shines out of this church. And it takes preparation. It takes expectation. But in order to prepare perfectly, in order to get ourselves ready, we got to stop pointing the blame. We have to stop pointing the finger, complaining, speaking wickedly. Amen? You can't expect to receive something in your life if all you're, all you're saying and all you're talking about is negative complaining. You'll never receive anything good because you're just speaking words of death over and over again. So whether you fast from food, if you want to skip a meal, skip a meal. If you want to fast from watching the ugly news, you should fast and never return. But there are some things that we should fast and never pick back up. Like the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedly. So I'm going to make a promise to you that for, the, for, for this month, and I'll pick it up later. For this month, I am purposely fasting from complaining in all areas of my life. My wife is my witness and my church is my witness. I want the power and the presence of God to not just fill this place, but my home, our place, everywhere we go. And so I'm doing that. If you want to do it with me, if you want to join me, you ever remember those, those challenges you would see on social media, the ice bucket challenge? And I'm, I, you'd film a video and all that. Well, I'm challenging you. Don't complain at all this whole month and see what happens in your life. I can guarantee you that the power and the presence of the Lord will not, it'll, they'll be revealed in your life. They'll start to show out in your life. Why? Because you're preparing. You've been preparing. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Well, stand to your feet this morning as we get dismissed. Somebody say, thank God. Whoever said that, let me talk to you after service. Did you enjoy our first service today? Glory to God. First of many, thank you, Jesus. You are so good to us, Father. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We bless this church in Jesus' name. We call it prosperous in the name of Jesus. Whoever steps foot into these doors is a blessed and a prosperous person. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word that you gave us this morning. Let it bear fruit with us. Let it be a a bountiful harvest, Jesus, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hey, if you want prayer this morning, we have prayer ministers in the front. How about that? We got a little bit more room for prayer now in here. Glory to God. We have a, if, if, if you haven't signed up for a small group, small groups are resuming again this Wednesday, I think, uh, hopefully. Small groups are, resu- are resuming on Wednesday, men's group and a women's group at 6.30. We have a connect card on the front or the back of these seats if you want to fill out a connect card or a small group card, wherever they're at. It's a new building. I don't know where all the protocols are and stuff like that, but why don't you just enjoy this place? Go walk around the courtyard. Take a look at our kids' facility downstairs. If you haven't gone to the bathroom, go check them out because we redid all of everything. So have fun. Have a, a tour. I will not be touring with you, but go watch and see what the Lord has done in this place, and uh, you'll be blessed. I believe it. Let me bless you as we go, though. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I bless you. I call you prosperous, whatever you set your hands to do. I pray that all week that you remember the good word. I remember you, I pray that you remember what the Lord has done in the past and you're reminded of what he's going to do in your future. I pray you continue to live in the victory and always remember you're welcome here in our family of faith. We'll see you guys next week. You're dismissed. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. Consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any other videos that we post here. Also, share this with a friend so that they too can hear the gospel of grace. Don't forget, every Sunday and every Friday, you can tune in live with us as we study the Word of God together.